Welcome to the Bible study lesson preview for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is designed for Bible study teachers who are preparing for a lesson to deliver to a group of Bible students or a Bible study. But if you're a Bible learner, a Bible student, welcome. And I hope you're able to learn something through this also. So we will be using five key ingredients throughout this lesson preview preparing for a Bible study of a prayer, scripture reading, explanation, asking questions, and then applying the scripture to our lives. And we'll typically put this at the end. So the sequence that we'll use to combine these five different ingredients in this lesson is as follows. We'll, uh, we'll start off with prayer. Then we'll have a word of uh, introduction or ex- explanation here. Then we'll read the entire passage. Then we'll repeat this process of uh, making a point, offering some explanation. We'll actually have some fill in the blanks from a from a handout, from an outline. Then we'll ask some questions. And so we'll iterate on this sequence quite a bit about explaining something, asking questions, maybe exploring it together as a class. Then as we conclude, we'll wrap up with some application points and then we'll uh, finish up in prayer. So this is the the outline that will follow regarding the lesson today. So let's open up in a word of prayer as we begin to explore Second Thessalonians chapter two. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together, for the opportunity to open your word, to, uh, to dig into scripture. We thank you for uh, the apostle Paul and his uh, faithfulness and his diligence in uh, correcting misunderstanding and encouraging and exhorting. I pray, Lord, that those words from Second Thessalonians will fill us today and that we'll get something out of this, that you'll Help us to remain attentive and alert and receptive to the truth of your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've prayed, asked the Lord to to bless us, to be with us during our time of scripture study. So now let's move into this this time of explanation. So uh, continuing in 2 Thessalonians, we have Paul writing to a church Uh, He's probably writing from Corinth, which is in the southern part of modern day Greece, writing back to Thessalonica, where he had helped establish a church some months before, possibly less than a year prior. So he had written his first book or first letter of first Thessalonians to them. And now he's writing up, writing a follow up letter of second Thessalonians to clear up a few things. So that brings us to today's lesson title, clearing up a misunderstanding. So this is what we'll call today's lesson about clearing up a misunderstanding. So what exactly is that misunderstanding? Well, let's move forward with reading the scripture. So here are the 12 verses that we'll be looking at today. And if you're teaching this as a Bible study lesson, you could just read this as a teacher, or you could assign this, maybe ask for volunteers from the class and say, uh, person one, would you read these uh, first four verses, and then person two, would you read the rest? Or maybe you want to split this up into into three people and have them read aloud from where they're sitting in the class. This creates some interaction and helps some some other folks to become involved in the in the Bible lesson. But let me go ahead and just read this. This will be key to what we're uh, studying today. So, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through twelve. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Verse five, don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this and you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until, until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of law of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders serving the lie and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. So we have a lot of events that are related in this passage, a lot of uh, 
a lot of truth, a lot of clarity that Paul's bringing to the situation. So let's begin to step through this, uh, through this passage in a way that involves some explanation, but also involves some questions and some asking. So to do that, I'll be working from, from this outline, and I'd like to hand this out as soon as we finished the Bible study reading in class. So I would actually hand out a printed sheet like this to the to the class members or the students. And on the left side is an outline that we'll be fin- filling in as we step through the verses, which are indicated here in parentheses. And then on the right side, we have some discussion questions that correspond to these different sections of, uh, of the outline. So one approach would be when you finish the Bible reading is to, with, with just this very brief introduction that I provided, you could give these this sheet to the class, hand it out, and then ask the class to work through the discussion questions. And so one way to do this would be to divide the group into, uh, into tables or into small groups of three, four, maybe six people each, and then have each group start on a different question. So these don't have to be answered sequentially. So you could say group one, start here, group two, start here, group three, start here, and then give them uh, five to 10 minutes or however long you can uh, you can afford with your with your class length and give them some amount of time to discuss these. Some of these can be dis- can be answered relatively quickly, but they're designed to have more open ended answers where they can't just uh, say yes or no and and move on. But so if you assign different questions to different groups, small groups, then also instruct them that if they finish a question, move on to this next question. If they start with question five, move on to question one. So there shouldn't be a, a they shouldn't necessarily be finished too soon. And there's enough questions here that could extend far beyond 10 minutes. So you can make sure that they'll be having a good discussion time as they move through these questions. But the benefit of doing these questions up front is that then they will have, as uh, as a small group, have written down a few answers. And then when you go through this outline, you can begin to bring in these questions. So instead of just waiting awkwardly for someone to be brave enough to raise their hand and answer a question, and then you have sort of a, a one-on-one interaction with just that one person who's answering this question. Now you have a group of people who have already thought about this, who've written, maybe jotted a few notes down, and then they're ready to bring those into discussion as you work through the outline. So it makes for, I think, a more, a more richer and interactive discussion because they've already taken part in thinking about this, and then they can combine those thoughts with your outline as a teacher, and it makes for a, uh, for a good discussion and a good interaction. Okay, so with that said, let's work through this outline, and then I'll be bringing in these discussion questions um, as we as we go through, so let's. Uh, I'll be flipping back and forth between the scripture and the outline and the discussion questions. So there might be a little bit of a, of page shuffling here. But first off, when Paul begins this chapter, he is trying to clear up this idea of the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to Him. So he's offering a word of encouragement, and he wants to clarify some problems that he's seen with with the church. In Thessalonica, apparently they were of the belief that they had missed the rapture. That that, that uh, because they knew they were facing persecution, that they were uh, in the middle of this tribulation that they knew about, and so they had just begun to uh, stop stop trying to do anything. They were resigned to their fate, if they will, and so. Uh, Paul was seeing some some disturbing things happening that were based on their misunderstanding. So that kind of brings us back to our lesson title. We need to clear up this misunderstanding, and that's what Paul is doing with this letter. So he offers them a word of encouragement to not be upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us. So he's um, reacting to probably some false teaching that they've received. So a prophecy could be someone saying, I've received a word from the Lord. Uh, It's not what Paul wrote you. It's not, um, it's not anything you've heard before, but this is just, trust me, this is from the Lord. So this is this, that could be considered a a prophecy or a false prophecy in this case. Um, A message, someone maybe said, oh, here's what Paul said, but they weren't telling the truth. Or someone could have even sent a letter that was supposedly from us. So Paul is referring here to some sort of a problem or misinformation that they received that alleged that the day of the Lord has come. So he is working to clear this up. So one question that we could begin to ask um, on the discussion side of things, how can we be sure that a message is true? 
If, if we're getting lots of messages, as a, as a matter of fact, just the other day, I looked uh, in my email and there was a message from a, uh, an older woman from Asia who said that she was actually uh, quite ill and didn't expect to live much longer and requested quite sincerely, and, and she had quite a bit of information about this situation, that um, she has uh, $15.5 million that's available to give to charities and to um, uh, technical training schools and a lot of really good things she had planned for this. But if she could just get my help to receive this money and to distribute this money, that she's willing to give me a portion of that money. Now, we know just from the, the sound of it, that's a scam. And uh, it was a, uh, you know, unfortunately, these are, these are quite rampant. And if you have an email address, you've probably received some of these of people from other continents around the world having some amount of money that they just need your personal information and maybe they just need a bit of money from you to facilitate the transaction. So this is, that's an outright scam, someone trying to extract money from me by gaining my trust. But in Paul's day, there was maybe not a financial scam, but a spiritual scam or a scam relating to the truth of, of end times and what was going to happen. Or uh, if we want to be a bit more charitable, we could just say, misinformation. Maybe it was honest misinformation, but in, in, in effect, it was still a, a message that was not true. So one question you could ask your students is, how can we be sure that a message is true, especially if it's purporting to be from the Lord or of the Lord and it affects spiritual things and things, ways that we could behave, should behave and decisions we should make? How do we verify this, right? So we might be able to think about, is this um, consistent with prior messages that we've received? Does it align with the truth? So if someone says, here's a message from God, but it doesn't sync with the Bible, it's not consistent with scripture, then we can reject that because God doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't say one thing and then say something else that's completely opposite. So <clears throat> this idea of messages and truth and how to verify and validate messages, I think could be an interesting source of discussion for you. So as Paul uh, finishes up this word of encouragement to not be upset or troubled by these messages, these other messages, non-legitimate messages that they've received, then he begins to kind of describe some upcoming events. So he continues uh, with these other things that are going to be happening, but he's already covered in verses one and two, what we would, what we would call the, the coming of our Lord. So if I'm going to fill this in here, the, um, Coming of our Lord, okay. And then this second concept, which kind of is an overarching concept for this passage, is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. And we'll get into what he means by by this and the timeline of it in just a moment. But let's continue with some other events that he lays out here. In verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The apostasy, not a word I use every day, but this is from the Greek word apostasia, right, which means departure or abandoning, a complete abandonment um, of the truth of God's plan. So there's, and this is not just an apostasy. This is the apostasy, which will become significant. And then he also refers to, but, but so this day of the Lord won't come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Lawlessness, right? And we doesn't use the word antichrist here, but that is, we're talking about end times and we're talking about events leading up to Christ's second coming. So this is a reference to the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the man doomed to destruction. So Jesus wins in the end. That's very good news, but there's a lot that goes on before that happens. And then he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God. And this is quite reminiscent of the, uh, the passage in Daniel chapter 11. Let's look at this. When Daniel is referring to the Antichrist, then the king, this isn't the king of kings. This is a small king, right? The, uh, the Antichrist the little king who will eventually be defeated. Then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God. And he will say outrageous things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the, the time of wrath is completed because what has been decreed will be accomplished. So this is referring to the work of the Antichrist in the end times. And when we, when we read about someone magnifying himself above every God, then that parallels Paul's description here of he sits in the temple so sits in God's temple, 
proclaiming that he himself is God. So this, this blasphemy occurs as part of the end times timeline. And so Paul is laying out these different events that, um, that need to be aligned, that need to be made right in the minds of the Thessalonians because it's, it's their misunderstanding that has them thinking that they're in the middle of the, of the tribulation because they are under some persecution as believers in their, in their city. So they've just kind of misunderstood where they are in the timeline and how they should respond to that. So, um, so that can bring us to a, uh, another discussion question, kind of related to the, the first one in a sense, but what are ways that people try to deceive us? What are deceptions that we, were, that we are most susceptible to, right? So in verse three, we're exhorted to not let anyone deceive you in any way. Well, let's ask what, what kinds of deceptions are we susceptible to? Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to go through every type of sin and every type of temptation that everyone faces in great detail here, but there, there might be some themes that make us aware of the, um, the pressures and the, and the temptations and the possible deceptions that we face. I mean, one theme that I uh, can think of is if there's something that we want now, right, rather than in God's timing, that can lead us to uh, be deceived and maybe pursue things outside of God's plan. So we remember the original sin, Adam and Eve in the garden wanted to know, they wanted this knowledge about uh, good and evil and, and they wanted to be like God because they were going to receive some knowledge that God had. Well, and indeed they did get that knowledge with horrible, tragic uh, consequences that we're still dealing with to this day. But we, when we think of things like comfort or, or money or entertainment or pleasure or knowledge, right? These are some things that we want now. And if someone is offering something to us that purports to give us those things immediately, such as this uh, 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 tragically ill woman from Asia who was trying to get me a part of $15.5 million, right? If, if I really needed that money and I thought I, I kind of want to believe that, then the, then I could be deceived by that, right? And I think um, uh, deceivers or, or con artists or scammers on our own day sometimes play on our own desire to to want something to be true. And if they can uh, if they can assert that that is true, then they can begin to build on that, and it begins a, a very dangerous uh, web of deception. So that's just one kind of way to think about this this deceptions that we might be susceptible to. But your your class your uh, your members may have some other thoughts on that. So. We have a number of these uh, events that are described, and we've got some more coming down here too. But let's see if we can't begin to build a timeline around how all of these things uh, these things play out together. So one um, overarching timeline that I think has been helpful to understand is one that our uh, pastor has shared with us, and this is what he calls three arrows and two lines. So if we look at this um, simple diagram here, we have uh, three arrows, one up, one down, one to the right, and two lines, one squiggly and one dashed, one straight. And I think this is an, a good uh, tool to understand the, the timeline of end times. Now, this does take a pre-tribulation view, right? Because we have the rapture, which we will call, uh, which is Christ coming for his church. We have that occurring before the tribulation. So these are actually five different events that we've sequenced with these symbols. And so if the rapture, the rapture is Christ coming for his church. If we pr place that first, then we would, we would hold that this is a pre-tribulation view. This is the rapture coming before the tribulation. This is also a pre-millennial view, right? The Bible speaks to a thousand year reign of Christ, some believe that's maybe more metaphorical or they, they, they would be amillennial, millennialists or ones who do not believe in the millennium itself. And there could be post-millennial, pre-millennial. But this, this view with the rapture coming before the millennium and before the tribulation is a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view. So we have these arrows and lines that, that explain and help us remember the end times events of Christ coming for his church, right? So we're raptured up. We're taken out uh, quickly uh, without warning. And this is uh, something that we saw in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, chapter 5. Let's look at that, right? So uh, let's see. We have, 
about the, about the times and seasons. So this was in the previous letter that Paul wrote to them, right? The day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So this, this beginning of these events will happen suddenly. And then we also have that, uh, uh, God did not appoint us to this wrath. So, uh, one view is that this wrath of the tribulation, the seven years of worldwide calamity, we will be spared from that as believers. So I think this view is consistent with what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5. Namely, it's going to come quickly. We'll be raptured out. The, the believers will be, will be taken out of this world. And then God did not appoint us to wrath. So we're going to be spared from the tribulation. So that, I think, is an argument for a pre tribulation view of the rapture. So here we are raptured out. Then there's this seven years of worldwide calamity, which is spoken of in other other passages in the Bible. Then Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, right? Christ returns with his church. And then there's the beginning of this 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth with his people. And then at the end of that, when uh, Satan is finally conquered and uh, and cast away, then we have a new heaven and a new earth for believers and hell or eternal separation from God for the unbelievers. So this, this is, a, I think, a, an apt and helpful uh, illustration of the end times sequence. And then, if I, if I may add, we kind of have where are we now, right? Well, Jesus came to earth. So if we wanted to add a couple more arrows and lines, Jesus did come to earth. And now we are in the church age, which I'm putting as dots. We don't exactly know how long this is going to last. This is sort of a dotted line here, but we're over here. We've not been raptured and, uh, and we will be spared the tribulation. So the Thessalonians were thinking somehow they had missed the rapture. They're in the middle of the tribulation. They just need to to stop doing things and just try to survive until Jesus comes again. So they were mistakenly viewing themselves in this in this part of the timeline, whereas they should be understanding that they were still in, in the church age over here. So that's what Paul is trying to, to clear up through this passage. Now, um, we as we continue on, we will see quite a few more events. So let's Let's go ahead and just get a quick preview before we finish our outline of all these different events. So we, we talked about, uh, we saw in verse one, a reference to our being gathered to him, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord, the apostasy. We're going to get into the mystery of lawlessness. We talked about the man of lawlessness in verse three. Then there's this idea of there being a restraint on the man of lawlessness, which will be removed. Then the lawless one will be revealed. And then Jesus destroys the lawless one. So we already read about all those in uh as we read the passage, but let's go ahead and just, uh, I've pre, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna turn this upside down. And what we're gonna do is, we're going to release all of these into their own, into their own and begin to place them on the timeline. So Paul references a lot of events, but let's see if we can't kind of align these with the timeline and sync it with what he's trying to tell us here in, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So now I have to turn all of these upside down. So he referred to the apostasy. And you remember one of his, uh, one of his insights was that the apostasy, uh, that the day of the Lord would not occur until after the apostasy, right? So we have the day of the Lord after the apostasy. And then we, he says the mystery of lawlessness, we'll read in a little bit, is already kind of among us. And our being gathered to him and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? That happened back to back in verse one. So we can begin to kind of align these with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, right? Is a description of the rapture. So we have that here. Then we have this idea of the apostasy in the middle of the tribulation. We just read about in, uh, in Daniel chapter 11, right? That this antichrist will do outrageous, abominable things, right? And he will be revealed. So we have the apostasy coming in here in the tribulation the, the, with the man of lawlessness. Then he will be revealed. And then after this, we read the day of the Lord begins. And then uh, we can also begin to think about, we talk about the restraint being removed. We'll talk about that in a second. But that, uh, I think, aligns with sort of the beginning of the tribulation, right? As, as this, 
uh, calamity begins and as, as the Antichrist begins to do his work, it's because a restraint has been removed. So we can, maybe we can just move this down like this, okay? So now we have the day of the Lord, and what do we have left, right? Now we have the mystery of lawlessness that has been occurring, and then we have Jesus destroying the lawless one that will come here at the, uh, at the end. So we, we can begin to take these events that Paul describes in Second Thessalonians, and we can place them along this timeline, and it, and it does work, right? There are things that are already happening. We're going to, without a moment's notice, be, be, be raptured, taken out of this world. Then there's the restraint that's removed. The man of lawlessness begins his work. There's this apostasy, and he's revealed to be the evil one that he is, right? Despite their, um, in other passages of the Bible, we learn that he can, uh, will broker a peace and there'll be this false peace that occurs during the first part of the tribulation. But then when he's revealed, that goes away. But then in the end, Jesus wins and destroys the lawless one. So we're, um, we're grateful for that. And then this day of the Lord um, has not begun already, but will begin after this sequence of events kicks off. So that was part of the, uh, the misunderstanding that the Thessalonians had is that they were already in the middle of this day of the Lord and they were, um, they were troubled by that. Okay, so let's um, set that timeline aside and we'll continue on with our outline. So, so Paul relates these upcoming events, what I'm calling part one, and then there's a little bit of a, uh, of a pause where he comes back to the current situation or even the, the recent past. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this? So guys, come on, let's, let's remember what we just went over is effectively, I think, what he's saying. And you know what currently restrains him, right? The Antichrist. So... Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what that restrainer is so that he will be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining, there's a reference to the restraint again, the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. So let's think about um, this discussion question. What do you think the mystery of lawlessness is already at work means in the first part of verse seven, right? So you could, you could, um, why not just say lawlessness is already at work? What, what is this idea of the mystery of lawlessness? Well, we can see in our own culture, there is, um, uh, there, there is sin that happens and there are things that, are, uh, that occur that are contrary to, to the Lord's word. But I think more of that will be revealed as we move into the end times or, or even as the tribulation begins, that lawlessness will be revealed in even more detail, right? So this idea of things uh, already being present now that will then be amplified or clarified in the future, I think speaks to this word, uh, the mystery. And we can think in our own culture that there are lots of things where, uh, you know, death is being confused with life or purity is being uh, confused or impurity is being confused with purity. So uh, there are people who, who celebrate impurity, uh, sexual immorality, um, uh, violence, uh, and you don't have to look any further than the, the top, top shows on, uh, on television or the streaming services, right? Many of them deal with themes of the occult or uh, uh, sexual immorality or violence as entertainment. So, right, we, we have this, this lawlessness, this disrespect for the things of the Lord already kind of woven within aspects of our society, but it's, um, it's not as bad now as it will be in the future. And so we see this idea of lawlessness already at work. So, um, so there's this sort of speaking to the current situation a little bit in verses 5 through, through 7a. And then we have this idea of the restrainer. So let's move on to sort of the second part of of seven, verse seven here, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. So what is the restrainer, right? If the restrainer is referred to as a he, then I believe this is a reference to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So Christ is in heaven, but his presence, his spirit, the Holy Spirit is with us and is restraining Lawlessness. So this brings us to another another discussion question here is, um, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, how does the Holy Spirit restrain lawlessness in our world today? What are examples? Well, we can think of the church, the believers 
who are men and women who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them and are controlled by, uh, are not slaves to sin, but are instead uh, have the mind of Christ and are being sanctified in this world and, 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 and are being made more like Christ, right? These believers then have laws, have principles, uh, speak out when, when, uh, when they see that lawless things are being done, when, when things are being done that are contrary to the Lord's word. So there is a restraint from the Holy Spirit himself, but then we could also say from believers and from the church um, that are being guided and led by the Holy Spirit. So this could be in the form of laws and uh, societal norms that hold back some of the lawlessness. So there maybe your class could, could think of some examples of that and the way that the Holy Spirit is, is at work of restraining the lawlessness. So then, um, so let's, let's fill in these, these blanks as we kind of work through the last part of our outline here, right? So we have in verse 7b, uh, the, uh, the the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one restraining will do so until he is out of the way. So we talk about the removal, the removal of the restraint, right? Which which can usher in the beginning of the tribulation because now if the believers are out, the restraint is, is removed, then this lawless one, the Antichrist, has so much more freedom and power to begin to, to work through this period of the tribulation, right? So... Then we have, in the, in the middle of the tribulation, we have the, the revelation or the revealing. So I'll just say uh, revealing. The revealing of the lawless one does happen. And we have a reference to that here. And then the lawless one will be revealed, right? So the, the, res, the restrainer being out of the way, to me, that sounds a lot like the rapture, is that the believers and um, are, are out of this world are taken away, and then the lawless one in during the tribulation is revealed, right? And then the Lord Jesus will destroy him, right? So later in the end times chronology, we have the destruction of of, of this lawless one, the Antichrist, by Jesus. So Paul continues to give us hope, right, and encouragement that Jesus wins in the end. It's not going to be all easy and um, perfect until then, but there's a reassurance that this uh, this evil one will be destroyed by Jesus. So we've talked about some of these questions related to the restrainer and lawlessness. And then as we move into the last few verses of this, uh, of this passage, we have the coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working, every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders serving the lie. So we talk about every wicked deception among those who are perishing. So this, I think, this, these last few verses refers to the perishing. So we'll fill that in as the last one here. And then the corresponding question that we asked earlier was, how does Satan deceive people? What is this love of the truth in verse 10 that they've, that they've rejected? They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. How does Satan deceive people? Well, we've already talked about that a bit earlier when we talked about question two, right? Ways that, that people are, others are trying to deceive us, but if they're pulling us away from the truth of scripture, they are in the employ of Satan. They are working against Christ. Now, they may be not the Antichrist, but they are little types of Antichrist. So, um, this passage goes on to refer to the Antichrist, but how does Satan deceive people? Well, he's, he is at work in this world, and this does make reference to uh, specific miracles and signs of wonder serving the lies. So Satan has been granted for a time specific powers, even, shall we say, supernatural powers that are not from God, but that God allows him to have. We think back to uh, when Moses and Aaron were... were uh, uh, asking Pharaoh if they could leave, right? The Pharaoh's um, uh, magicians would do magic tricks. Now, were those completely fake magic tricks, uh, or were they were they magic tricks that were from uh, tapping into the power of Satan? So these are, these are these are valid questions. And Satan has a lot of a lot of tricks, a lot of truly deceptive signs and wonders that serve his lie and serve to pull people away from the truth and towards this deception. So we need to be very aware of that. And one way to do that is to love the truth. 
So um, the opposite of serving the lie would be serving the truth. So they did not accept the love of the truth. And we can ask the question, maybe your, your uh, class members have, have some perspective on this. What is the love of the truth, right? If we think of God's word as true, then do we love God's word? Are we spending time with God's word? You've probably heard, you know, how do you show someone that you love them? Well, you don't ignore them. You don't um, run away from them. You're spending time with them. So if we love God's word, if we love the truth, are we studying God's word? Well, clearly we are right here, so that's great. But are we individually working through the Bible? Are we, are we memorizing God's word? Are we loving the truth? And then why would people reject this, right? So if we have this love of the truth that can save us through faith in Christ, then why would someone reject it? Well, we, we can't underestimate the, the temptation and the allure of sin and the things that, that it can bring us right now in our time and, and in contrary con- contrast to God's time. So people, people become deceived and they get so into this sinful cycle that it's, it's uh, difficult or impossible for them to, uh, to break out. So that kind of explores this question of why do people reject this? So we've stepped through this, uh, these verses, these 12 verses, and we've looked at these different passages. We've established kind of the timeline and how all of these pieces fit in. And I think this does serve as an encouraging word from the Apostle Paul, not only to the church at Thessalonica, but to us. So then this uh, sixth item, which you could withhold from the, from the earlier discussion, you could assign these five and, and sort of withhold this sixth as a group item if you'd, if you'd like to do this. But this is the application point. So I'd like to bring it back to our um, uh, lesson outline. Let's see how we let's flip back to our flow here that we were talking about. Okay, so we've been... We've been clearing up this misunderstanding. We opened in prayer. We had a brief introduction. We read the scripture and then we went through several points of explanation and then discussion questions. So we did this ask cycle about uh, four times here, uh, if not five times. And now we're moving on to application. So I've, I've just put this one question here at the bottom. As we expect the rapture, as we, if we're believers and we are looking forward to the rapture, what should we do? What should be our attitude? How should our actions change, right? This is the takeaway from this lesson uh, that we're trying to lead our students toward. So they may have jotted down some thoughts, or you could begin to build this uh, list of action points, application points, as you conclude the lesson. So what are some things we could do? Well, I think we can, we can rest assured, we can be encouraged, right, that God has a plan and that we are a part of his plan, and that he cares for us. And then here's this, um, he, he doesn't want us to go through this wrath. And so how can we avoid this wrath? Well, if we're believers, we have an assurance that we'll, that we'll be spared that. But if we're not a believer, then this, this is a great time. The, the salvation message here is embedded in this lesson. We can cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I've done things that displease you. Now, Jesus, come into my life. Holy Spirit, take control of me. Guide me. Direct me. I'm going to do a U-turn. I'm going to repent, and I want to follow you, Lord. So this is an opportunity. If any of your students don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this end times discussion and some very strong words about what happens if someone doesn't know Christ can be an opportunity to, uh, to open up that, that topic and that discussion. So we can also uh, uh, continue to take comfort in this. And as we take comfort in knowing what's ahead, we can begin to share the gospel, the good news. This speaks of some rather dreadful events and some some rather somber topics, but this is always uh, countered with the positive, right? It's it's the love of the truth that saves us. So just as the love of the, the not accepting the love of the truth sends them to hell, the acceptance of the love of the truth can save us. So with all of these negative messages, there's also a positive message. So we can, we can receive that as a, as a truth that as believers, we need to be sharing the message. We don't need to be scared of what's ahead, but instead we need to be showing Christ to others through our own lives and through our own actions. And so there's, a, I think, a number of different application points you can bring out from your class related to how do we apply this lesson. 
I think one temptation is when we get into these end times uh, grids and timelines, it's actually, it's interesting. And for the analytical types, Maybe, maybe, you know, I'm prone to this, right? I enjoy uh, what's going to happen when and, and piecing all the pieces of the Bible together, which is can be a very helpful tool to understand God's plan. But at the same time, if we get caught up in this and become fascinated and drawn in to all of this analysis without remembering what we should be doing as we look forward to the rapture and without remembering how we should respond to others and, and share with others and work to, uh, to, to spread the good news, then this can be, um, this can be a problem if we're, not, if we're not guided by the Holy Spirit and are taking a, uh, a practical approach to these end times lessons and, and Paul's effort to clear up this misunderstanding. So we've, uh, we've stepped through the 12 verses the first 12 verses of Thessalonians chapter two. And so now as we wrap up, let's go ahead and uh, pray and we will conclude our time together. Dear Lord, thank you for this time of learning, for Paul's scripture, for the, for the words that he has spoken to us through the second chapter of Thessalonians. And Lord, we know that this is some, some tough teaching because it talks about people uh, not accepting the truth and uh, being separated from you. and But we also know that the love of the truth and the turning to you can, can save us, Lord. And so we thank you for that free gift of salvation that's available to everyone. We thank you for the truth of scripture. And I pray that this would inspire us and your scripture would continue to guide us, that they would be, we would be in your word and that we would be um, following you, following the truth, and uh, that we would be wary of false messages or those who would try to deceive us or distract us from what we know we need to do from your word. So thank you, Lord, for this lesson. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, then that concludes our lesson preview. Thank you.